Well, good morning again, Liberty Church Foley. How are we doing today? Y'all a little sleepy? Come on. How we doing today? Give me a little feedback. Listen, man, this is, we are wrapping up week four of the Future is Bright series. We're wrapping that up today. Next week we launch, as you just heard, relaunch into a new season. We have 55,000 or so mailers going across all of the city. We're gonna have inflatables, food trucks, all of that. Uh, free Rita's for the first few hundred or so people, so you better get in line and get your Rita's, okay? It could go fast. There's nothing worse than standing in line and right as you step up to the truck, they're like, I'm sorry, sir, that's all you've got. That's, we're, we're out. What? What? So invite your friends and then uh, fight for your readers, okay? It's going to be good. <laughs> Today we are talking about hope. We're, get, we're going to wrap up this series. It's been all about hope. I don't know about you, but I've so enjoyed this series because there are so many people in our neighborhoods, in our community, and even in this building that we go through seasons of life and cycles of life where we just need hope. And hope is, that definition of hope is, is the, the, knowing that God is up to something and believing that God is up to something. It's a constant expectation that God is working and up to something. Let's look at Habakkuk. Have you all read Habakkuk lately? No? Okay, we're going to go there today. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 19. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. I love this verse. Here's the main idea today. Hope pulls me into God's future. God's, uh, hope pulls me into God's future for my life. I don't know about you, but I hate, I hate the feeling of being stuck. Have, have any of you ever really been stuck? Come on, talk back with me. Have you ever been stuck? I've seen a friend get stuck under a car. That was weird. It was, it, was, it was dangerous, but he got out alive, thank goodness. How many of you ever really been stuck? Here's what's crazy. When I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, I was born in the, at 1980. I was an 80s kid, 90s kid. Well, I, watched, I watched reruns of the 70s shows. I watched the 80s shows, and then I watched movies in the, up to the mid-90s. And I don't know about y'all, but I guess the whole world had a universal fear of quicksand I don't know if y'all remember that, but like you could watch Star Trek and William Shatner, he falls into quicksand. How did that happen on Mars or Venus? I don't know. Then you had like Star Trek and they, they got crazy with it. That quicksand, it had teeth coming out of it. It was like, it's going to, this quicksand will eat you alive. And then there was other quicksand that was just, anyway, we could go on and on. The Princess Bride, anybody watch The Princess Bride, you know, as you will. You know, that was a famous line in that movie. Uh, MacGyver, anybody MacGyverism? Yeah, quicksand, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> Duct tape could not save him from quicksand. Oh, my goodness. We've all experienced this fear in life, and this is what happens in life. I believe that sometimes we're just moving along in life. Life is moving along. Everything's going fine, and all of a sudden, we can find ourselves feeling stuck. And, and, and that quicksand could look like, if you will, quicksand could look like debt, the pressure of debt. It could look like demotion. Now I'm, I'm overqualified for this job, Lord. I had a great job and now I'm, I'm overqualified because I got demoted and I'm underpaid and, and it's not fair. And, and if we're not careful, we begin to feel the distance in our home and the distance in our relationships. And distance is like temporary peace. You know what I'm talking about? Like you stay in your room. You stay in your room. Well, at least we're at peace with one another, you know, because we're not talking. This is great. And it's temporary peace. But if we're not careful, that distance will become division and maybe even divorce. There's also things that settle in like depression all along the way, and our thoughts get deeper and more painful. But this is why we're talking about hope, and we're going to wrap up today with the future is bright. Amen. But this is what we've experienced in life, and we begin to ask the question, what would I do? And I had to ask this question with the dirt pit behind my aunt's house. We would go out and play in target practice. What would I do if I fell into quicksand? And based on all the movies and just like the sitcoms, I figured out a couple things that everyone does. 
And I think this is why we get so afraid. The first thing we do is we, you fall in, you get stuck, and then you're like, I wonder if there's a rope close by, a twine, a vine falling from a tree. If I could just, and I can, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty certain that every movie had the same writer because it was just out of the reach of grasp. You couldn't grasp it. You couldn't grab a hold of it. And you're like, Tonto, bring me, the, bring, me the, bring me the vine. The horse, Lassie, is bringing you the vine, the rope. Are you serious? And we wonder, is there anyone out there that can help? You know what I'm talking about. We wonder why did this happen? How did this happen? And then the second thing we do is we wait. Because you figure out if you, if you wiggle, you move too much, You know, I'm just going to stop moving because if I just stop moving and I hold on to what I have, if I just stop, then maybe I won't sink deeper. And then we don't do anything and we just stop doing. And I really believe we're talking to a few people today here, maybe even more because we've all asked this question when we fall into being stuck and it's, God, can't you see that I'm stuck? (laughs) And I love Habakkuk. And we're going to turn there right now because the story of Habakkuk, the life of Habakkuk, is in the Old Testament. It happens about 600 years before Christ is born. And this prophet, he's known as a minor prophet. And and what is a prophet? A prophet, most prophets speak, speak to the people. They go pray, they hear from the Lord, God gives them some instruction, and then they go speak to the people on behalf of God. This is Old Testament. Now, now... Habakkuk is different, though. He doesn't speak to the people on behalf of God. You get a glimpse of him speaking to God on behalf of the people. It's a very different conversation, and this conversation looks very much like the conversation many of us have had with God. I really believe that. Uh, In chapter 1, we don't have time to go through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and I'll tell you, we've lived in chapter 1 many times. We've lived in chapter 2. We're going to summarize it, and we've talked kind of about these without actually addressing Habakkuk actually reading all of Habakkuk. You can go read it this week if you want to, but chapter one is all about this prophet named Habakkuk saying, God, why are your people suffering? God, why are we stuck? And I'm left wondering, and I'm left wondering why. In Habakkuk chapter one, verse two, it says, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? Have you been there? How long must I call for help? But you do not listen or or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. And many of us feel that. And this is what's happening in chapter one. The children of Israel, they're being attacked by this crazy enemy called Babylon. The Babylonian empire is, they are ruthless and and they're attacking the children of Israel and they're losing their homes, their children, their life, their hope, and their future. And Habakkuk is crying out just like we do. We say, God, I know you can. I believe you can. I, I wish you would. You should have done this. But what I see in my heart is not actually, and what I believe in my heart is not lining up with what I see with my eyes because we're losing and I'm stuck. And God, why? That's chapter one. Aren't you glad we're not going to stay there long today? Whew. Okay, chapter two. God answers Habakkuk. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for answering me. Chapter two. It's all about the waiting. God says this, I'm about to do something amazing, Habakkuk. Yes, God, what are you going to do? He says, it's going to blow you away. Awesome, I can't wait to hear it, Habakkuk. Tell me, God, your enemy, the Babylonians, they're going to rise to more power for a while. What? Are you kidding me? Approximately this long. It's a lot of years, y'all. Are you serious? I'm going to be stuck this long? And we've felt this before, and he gets confused because he's in the waiting. And what he sees and what he knows God to do is not lining up with what he believes in his heart. You know what I'm talking about when things go from bad to worse. You wiggle, you wriggle, you try to get out of it, reach for the rope, and you sink a little deeper. And and, and, and this is about where they're at. They're like this high. Chapter 1, he's about this high. Chapter 2, he's about this high help. And that's where some of us feel like we are. Help. 
Is anyone out there? Just help, help. And this is what I want to encourage you in chapter 2. Habakkuk 2, verse 3. For the revelation, what is a revelation? It's an answer from God. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. Everybody say, wait for it. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Wait, you told me it was going to delay. But wait, wait, wait. Just wait for it and it will not delay. But you said it would wait. God, I'm confused. Wait for it and it will not delay. Though it lingers, wait. And this is what I want to encourage you in chapter 2. When it is not God's time, you cannot force it to happen. You better not try to force it to happen. Oh, you'll strive, you'll wiggle, and you will. (laughs) Help! You'll sink. When it's not God's time, you can't force it. But when it's God's time, you can't stop it. That encourages me. Up until the very end of chapter 2. This is why we all relate to Habakkuk. I know you may not have read the story, but you can this week. And, but it, when you hear Habakkuk, you, he will, you will hear him say words of angst and anger, even depression, disappointment, the deepest kind. How long, O oh Lord? Do you not hear me? Do you not see me? I can't believe it. Chapter 2, all the way up to the very end. And Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, the last chapter, the last verse of chapter 2, right in the middle, it says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. It reminds me of that psalm that the Davis, uh, psalmist David said, Be still and know that he is God. Be still in the waiting, and you got to know, but God. Everybody say, but the Lord, but the Lord. I'm hurting, I'm wondering, I'm waiting, I'm disappointed. I've asked him the questions, and I give you permission today. Paul's not in the notes. You have permission to ask God why. Chapter 1. You have permission. God, why? He didn't, he didn't, God didn't, you know, knock Habakkuk over. He didn't smack him. He listened to his whole chapter, his whole prayer, his whole cry, passionate cry. He heard it. Chapter two, God speaks to him all along. What? And then chapter three, finally, everybody say finally. Finally, it takes a shift. It takes a turn. And Habakkuk 3, 1 is this, a prayer of Habakkuk. Habakkuk 3, verse 1. I've passed this verse so many times, and it simply says this, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shijanoth. Hmm, that's a funny word. Shijanoth. Everybody say Shijanoth. Come on, say it loud like you know it. You're speaking another language, y'all. Shijanoth. Shijanoth. What is this word? Once it's spoken of in Habakkuk 3, the derivative of this word, shijon, is in Psalms. Mentioned one time. Psalms chapter 7, if you want to go study that. Shijon. What is shijon? Shijanoth, it's actually a musical term. It's a directive term that says, uh, it says this, for a congregation, that's y'all, y'all, to sing a song with wild, passionate singing. Man, did you experience some wild, passionate singing this morning? Did you sense the Holy Spirit? Did you sense God's moving in this place while we sang with wild, passionate singing? And it's rapid, not radio, y'all. You can change the radio, but that's, it's, it's actually rapid, rapid Rapid changes of rhythm, high-spirited praise, and vigorous enthusiasm. I'm sorry to offend you country fans. It is not the type of of singing that's like, I'm going to cry and whine in my beer. I said it. Or my wine. I'm just, you need some cheese to go with that wine. It is not that kind of singing, y'all. 
It is the kind of singing that says it could be that it could be that Disney song, that that majestic, hey yo ho, you know, like the Lion King lifted it up. It's like that kind of majestic. It's the kind of singing that's like, let it go. It's got that deep, you know what I'm saying, that rhythm. And it changes. I can't do the floss, but I will, I'll spare you, but it's that hip-hop beat that gets you moving, gets you jamming. When, back in the day, it was, it was a Roger Rabbit. Y'all don't even know. It's crazy. It was crazy. We did some crazy uh, funky fresh and crazy stuff. It's changes of rhythm, and it was directive. Shijanoth is not crying and whining, but if you did in chapter 1 and you did in chapter 2, it's okay. God can handle it. But Shijanoth is much, it looks much like what we did today. Shijanoth is singing and shouting and praising God with passion, with hope for your future. Shijanoth is, is and, and this is Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3 verse 1. What's crazy is God just told him it's going to go from a little bad to a little worse. And he, he shijanoths right before it gets better. This is what shijanoth is. It's praising God before the miracle happens. It's praising God before the financial breakthrough. It's praising God for who he is, not what he does. See, it's easy to praise God on a mountaintop when he just blessed you. I just got a promotion, Facebook world, God is good all the time. It's easy on the mountaintop. But Shijanoth is praising God when you are in the valley and you, you just are stuck and you're sinking and you're going, I don't know if it's going to get better, but I'm going to praise him anyway because he's good and he's faithful and I'm praising him because of the goodness of God. Shijanoth. And it, what is crazy, it's a high-spirited praise. It's a praise. See, some of us think, oh, it's just a little emotionalism. No, it comes from that place of the heart that says, God, I don't know if you're going to move. And even if you don't, I'm going to praise you anyway because what you've done for me is enough. You, you sent your son. You died on the cross. You saved me. You've rescued me. You've forgiven me. And what you've done is enough. You are more than enough. God. Amen. Shijanoth, I praise you for who you are, God, not for what you will do, not even for what you have done or what you might do. Habakkuk 3, 2, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Re repeat them in our day and in our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. What is Habakkuk saying? I've heard that you do great things, God. I believe it. Repeat it over again. Do it again, Lord. We sang it this morning. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds still being loosed. God, we believe it. What's crazy is right in between that says, yes, we can see it. But many of you, you don't see the miracle today. But we sang about it. We sang and praised God today for who he is, believing even though we don't see it here, we see it here, and we know it in our heart. Amen. God, I believe it. It's who you are. It's what you do. So how do we get unstuck? Hope pulls me into God's future for my life. If you're taking notes, point number one is remember. Everybody say remember. Remember the God things. Remember the God things in your past. Here's what I tend to do, and I don't know if you do this, but I tend to remember my past. I just remember my failure. I remember, my, I can remember my successes. I can remember so many things in life that have related to what I did or did not accomplish. I remember my past. But Habakkuk began to remember the God things. Look at Habakkuk 3, verse 3. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. You say, what does that have to do with me? Taman, Paran? Let me just explain it real quick if I can. These are two very distinct places in previous history in the children of Israel. 
It's our story. It's my story and your story. If you're a Christ follower and you believe in Jesus, this means the world to you. Because Tamon and Paran are two distinct places where after God let the children of Israel go from Egypt and they rescued they were rescued by him splitting the Red Sea open and they crossed on dry land and then the enemy Pharaoh and his army was swallowed up in the Red Sea and they were able to pass into the wilderness and eventually into the promised land Tamon and Paran are two definite distinct places where the children of Israel gave worship to God for who he is and what he has done amen Tamon and Paran. We don't really follow these words, and we're picking out a few words today that are different so that you can remember different. Tamon and Paran, if you feel stuck today, this is what Habakkuk began to do. God, you came and you met us there. God, your glory covered us there. You, you, we praised you and it filled the earth there. God, I remember verses four through six. It's not on the screen. I remember, oh, I remember. I remember your splendor. I remember your majesty. I remember your power. I remember the miracles and I remember the goodness and the faithfulness of God. I remember, and this is what we must do, church. We must remember. I encourage you, never stop remembering. I can remember being in college. I love the Lord. I served God. I was raised in a Christian home, but I got to a place where I was just tired. I got stuck. I got tired of some religious activity, and there was some judgmental church going on, and and I just got tired. I was working, 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 and trying to lead worship, lead worship. And God had spoken over my life, had people pray for me and say, man, you're not only called to, to do some business for a while, but you're also called to lead worship for a while. And then you're also called, I believe, to, to be a pastor. And I'm like, in what order? You have just confused me. I'm getting a finance degree. I want to drop out to get a worship degree. My dad said, that may not pay the bills, but, but it might. Do what God's called you to do. I'm like, how do I do both and, both and, both and? And, and as I began to sink in my confusion and my doubt in God and in people and pastors and church, I began to sin. And sin got caught up with me. And then I began to sink. And I almost dropped out. And I, I regret parents, do not let this happen. Pray over your kids. Pray circles around them. Because I went from a 3.75 GPA all the way to a 2. Point Oh, something GPA. It was rough, y'all. It was so rough. My dad's like, what's a W? I've never seen that on a report card. What's a W? I'm like, I was living at home. He's like, pack your bags, boy. I don't know what a W is. I'm like, winning. I'm winning in life. That's what I'm doing. He's like, no, you are not winning. I'm like, withdraw. Withdraw. Dang, that's a D. <laughs> and uh, I started doing terrible because it caught up to me. And the reality is, is I was reminded because my mom and my dad surrounded me and they didn't kick me out of the house. They loved me. And I had pastors who, who encouraged me. And I remember going to a worship service, much like we had today, and just kneeling. I was not bragging on my wife. I'm not even bringing attention necessarily to having to do this. This is not Shijanoth, but it could be. She kneeled, and I remember looking over at her today, and I'm like, I remember kneeling in that service saying, God, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. And I took communion, and I worshiped the Lord. And God immediately brought me back to that place of remembering who he is and what he's done for me. And who he's called me to be. And over the course of a couple of months and, a, and even a couple of years, I just began to grow and grow and mature to the point that just not even two years after that, coming from a place of a valley, I just experienced a mountaintop and now in the valley, I was being shipped off and I packed my bags and I graduated college with a three point, almost three GPA. I brought it back up, y'all. Woo, I be. Hey. Be students, rule the world. That's what I'm saying. That's true. <laughs> so here's the deal. Here's the deal. Um, and I went to Charlotte to be a youth pastor. I got my finance degree, business. I worked in banking, business. I was a part-time youth pastor, and I and simultaneously got to do all three, and I started a youth worship team. 
and led a youth worship band. And we grew from 15 students to about 100 students. 45 people got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, saved, 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 filled. It's all that good stuff. It was amazing. Baptisms. It was good. It's amazing how God will bring closure to a season if we can just shidgen off. It's a weird word, but it's so true. How do we get unstuck? Hope pulls me into God's future for my life. Point number two. I, I, number one, I must embrace. I must embrace. I mean, number one, I must remember. I must remember. Number two, number two, point number two is I must embrace what God is doing. It's one thing for me to believe it and say, God, I hope for it. I want to believe it. I hope to believe it, but I must start embracing what he is doing. And most people, we just try to endure and endure and gut it out. And we talked about that last week just to get to the end. But listen, Habakkuk embraced what God was up to in his life and in the life of the church, the children of God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16. You've felt this before. I'll read this verse. Habakkuk heard. He said, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones. My legs trembled. My heart pounded. This is not that pitter-patter that like, I waited for a wife, y'all, and I finally found my wife. My heart pitter-pattered when I saw her walk in the room. It was all a flutter. It was amazing. It's not that kind of pounding. It's the kind of pounding that you and I have felt whenever we feel crushed, we feel stuck, and your heart begins to pound and beat within your chest. And this is what Habakkuk 3, verse 16 says. Habakkuk said, yet I will wait patiently. I will wait patiently. Even though it looks like I'm stuck, even though it looks like it goes from bad to worse, I will wait patiently. He, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails. I mean, listen, he's looking at the livelihood of his family, the livelihood of the nation, the, the living and breathing that has to sustain them. And he's saying, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the stalls, no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. And this is what our prayer looks like. We say, though the miracle hasn't happened, and though the provision hasn't yet come, and though that, that son that I've been praying for and that daughter that I've been praying for is out there and they're doing some crazy, they have not come back home. And though my marriage feels like it's, and though my relationships feel, even though, even though I will believe it says, even though I pray and I pray, and Habakkuk is saying, even though I've cried my eyes out over this one. Habakkuk 3.18, I love this turn. It says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Amen? Man, we could take a praise break right there. I will shijanoth. I will rejoice. I will praise before the miracle, before the provision, before the circumstance changes, because I have faith in God and I embrace him. The thing that I've never told you about is Habakkuk's name. What does his actual name mean? His name means to embrace but there's this other side of the coin that says to wrestle, to wrestle. If you've ever watched someone wrestle, man, they, they, lock, they lock in and they wrestle. Chapter one, I'm wondering and I'm wrestling. I'm waiting and I'm wrestling. But it turns, yet I will shijanoth, yet I will praise you. And it goes from being a tug of war like Alabama versus Auburn or whatever. It goes from being, I'm going to pin you and hold you down and make you do what I want you to do, God. It goes from that to saying, I will embrace you in the valley. I will believe you, God, in the valley. I will worship you, God, in the valley. Not because of what you could do but because of who you are. He's, he's a man who wrestled with God, but he embraced what God was doing. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 19, I love this. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. 
I believe there's people in this room today that you're going to tread to new heights. What does that mean? You've been on a mountaintop before. You've gone to the valley. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your job. Don't give up on your future. Don't give up. If I could encourage you to keep wrestling, and you might have to stay in chapter 1 and chapter 2 for a while, keep wrestling with the Lord. It will turn. It will turn. And hope when you embrace God and get to that place that says, yet I will rejoice, yet I will sing of his name, yet I will remember, God, that you are good and you are faithful all of the time. My soul will sing to you. I will trust and know that he is God. Hope begins to pull you from the valley into new heights. And this is what I want to encourage you with. Most of the closeness and the times that, let me say it this way, the the times that I got to know God the most, his character, who he is, not what he could do, not the provision, not the blessing, not all the stuff that goes, yes, I love you for all that. No, no, no. When I got to know him for who he is, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't always on the mountaintop. It was in the valley when I had to wrestle And then I begin to embrace him. Amen. Closeness grows in the valley. Faith grows in the valley. And hope, when you embrace hope, it pulls you up and it pulls you out and it pulls you into your future. I believe this is what will pull your family into the future. I believe this is what, why we can say Jeremiah 29, 11, Thus saith the Lord, declares the Lord, I am good, and I have plans to prosper you, not harm you, to give you a bright hope and a future. Well, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for declaring that over my life, but I don't see it. Thank you for shouting that one from the rooftops and from the heavens. Thank you, Lord, but I don't know if I believe it. But when you begin to wrestle and embrace him, closeness, intimacy, faith grows. Faith grows in the valley. Faith grows in the valley. Your marriage begins to get closer. Your children gets closer. The the, the relationship in the home gets warmer, kinder. The love that you have for your neighbor actually increases. I don't just talk about them and say, "What? oh, I wish I had time to do that for them. They really need me right now, but I don't have time. I don't have time because of distance, because of so many things that I feel stuck about you actually will begin to walk into your future. It's a hope and a future. I believe this is what will pull this church into God's future. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. I'm gonna make a turn to the New Testament. Last week, we talked about Hebrews 10 verse 23, but I wanna wrap up today by looking at verse 24 and 25. Verse verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the rope, no, 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 to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love, toward good deeds. And this is key right in the middle. Not giving up. I'll say it again, not giving up. Not giving up. So many times we give up on marriage, we give up on life, we give up on jobs, we give up on people. We say we're a part of Team Jesus, but we give up. We say we're a part of the family, but we give up. We say we're gonna be there, but we give up because we're stuck. And God is saying, hold on to hope. But if you will not give up what meeting together, as some are getting in the habit of doing, even the New Testament church had a problem with this one. I'm tired of Sun, I'm tired of Sunday school, guys. I'm tired of that. That girl brings that same casserole every week. I'm tired of eating together. I'm tired of praying together. Same old prayer, hope in a future. Same old prayer. He's gonna do it. He's gonna turn it around for you. I'm tired of it. And even the New Testament church began to have a problem with meeting together. I believe 
that our future is bright because if we will not give up meeting together, we can begin to encourage one another. As the verse says, remember what God has done for you. Remember what he's done for your family. Remember what he's done for your children. Remember what he's done for this campus. Remember what he's done for this community. Remember what he's done. Embrace what God is doing in and through you. Embrace what God is doing in and through your family. Embrace the impact that you can make at your job. Embrace the impact you can make in your home. Embrace what God is up to and using you right where you are, even if you feel like you're stuck and in the valley. Embrace what God is doing. This is how we spur one another on. This is what I know that Liberty Foley Campus is going to keep doing. We're going to keep meeting on Sunday mornings. The future is bright. We're going to keep worshiping. I'm going to keep encouraging us as a congregation and this worship team to shijin off to praise him, even though it doesn't look like it's good, even though I don't feel like I'm good enough, even though I've heard someone say this week that, that, the, that, that lightning might strike me when I come through the doors of the church because my life is a wreck. If we would just shijin off and embrace God and worship him, we're gonna keep coming together. Don't give up on coming together. Don't give up on giving. Don't give up on serving. Some of you have been praying, God, I, need, I know I need to change. I need to change. Something needs to be. I'm spurring you on today. Don't give up meeting on Sunday. Don't give up. Get plugged into serving. Put on a Future is Bright shirt. Put on a Team Jesus shirt. Put on a, put on a Liberty shirt and serve. Serve in the community inside these walls, outside these walls, but serve and spur one another on. And this is what the Bible says. You will grow and mature. Keep encouraging one another. I'm going to ask you today to join a group. Get plugged in. Kick off your semester. Kick off some September by joining a group and get connected so that you don't pull away. Serve one another. Eat together. Pray together. Encourage one another. This is what the New Testament church was all about. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I'm going to read this last verse over you as a prayer, and then we're going, to, we're going to pray over a couple things. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trial of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance, perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Hope is pulling you into your future today. It's the hope of Jesus. He speaks over your life to give you a future and a hope. If you've never given your life to Christ today, you've never given your life to Christ, you say, today is the day. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to surrender. Because what Habakkuk was a prophet, he was actually speaking to God in such a way that said, one day there is going to be a man coming and his name is Jesus and he's going to live a blameless life and he's going to surrender everything and he's going to lay down his life on the cross and he's going to die on the cross and overcome death in the grave and be raised again so that we can experience forgiveness of sin, forgiveness of shame, forgiveness of every evil thing I've said or done or thought. And today is your day. If you, if you say, I'm gonna make Jesus the Lord of my life and surrender to him today, would you just shoot your hand up right where you are? Right where you are, amen, amen. I see your hand, amen, amen. Let's pray this out together, church. Say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I surrender my life, my will, my plans to you. You're the Lord of my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and shame. 
thank you for your mercy. I receive it today. I receive your forgiveness. Just do that right now. I receive your forgiveness and your mercy today. Thank you for receiving me into your family, and I will follow you, Jesus, all the days of my life. I will get to know you. Tell him, I'll get to know you like you know me, and you want to know me even more. I will get to know you in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen and amen. Listen. Right in this moment, this is a very key moment. As we were praying earlier, and I just began to worship and praise, I looked around and tears just began to stream down my face because I believe there are people today that you might just need to take a moment right where you are. You can stay seated. You can just lift your hands. You can say a prayer to God. Some of you may need to just stand to your feet and begin to lift your hands and shijanoth. Because you're praying about something. You're concerned about something. And you're wondering, is God with me in the valley? And today, you just need to tell him right where you are in the valley, I will worship you for who you are. I will lift my hands right in this moment. It doesn't matter that I got the doctor's report of cancer. It doesn't matter that we're having that test done. It doesn't matter that I got this this division in my home. Today, can we just, if that's you today, could you just take a moment and begin to remember what God's done? for you and just maybe begin to lift your hands and worship the Lord and say, God, I will shid you not, I will praise you even in the valley, even in the valley. God, I'll remember, God, I'll remember how you saved me. I'll remember, God, I'm just shid you right now for myself. God, I just remember when you healed me of that 13, I had chronic migraines and I couldn't even get out of bed for three and four days at a time. And I didn't know if I could go to school or play baseball or learn an instrument, God. And I, and I was tired, God. But I remember walking down to, to the altar. I remember walking down to the platform and saying, I need help. And I wanted you to do it quicker. And I got angry with you when you didn't. And you never gave up on me, God. And, and as I began to praise you and worship you for who you are within a few short months, God, it stopped. And I remember how you healed me. Of migraines. I remember how you healed me of a stomach bleeding ulcer when I was 21, and then I had a relapse again and almost lost more than half of my blood internally, and I could have died on the table. And you, God, spared me. And I remember, and I'm thankful, God, and my soul today just cries out to you and says, I believe you, and I worship you, not for what you're going to do, but for who you are. And I thank you, God. You're the God of my life. I thank you that you give me a hope and a future. Church, hope is pulling you into your future. Put your trust in him. Go home and shijanoth. Amen.